Matthew Tree was born in London at the tail end of 1958. He's lived in Barcelona since 1984. For literary reasons of his own, in 1990 he stopped writing in English and switched to Catalan, in which language he has published ten books, including two novels, a collection of short stories, an autobiography, a rant against work, and a personal essay on racism. In English he has published a collection of articles and essays entitled Barcelona, Catalonia, A View from the Inside, published by Cookwood Press, Massachusetts, USA. Snug is his first published novel written in his native tongue. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you very much. We're here in Barcelona, a city in which you've lived for 28 years? That's okay. right, yeah. So first question is, how would the literary tourist best prepare for a trip to Barcelona? Okay, well, it depends on what you're looking for. A lot of people come to Barcelona uh, because of their interest in the Civil War. Barcelona was a major focus of the Civil War. It was the last bastion of resistance to the fascist uh, forces in Spain. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a huge literature on the subject, but I would recommend two books, uh, one obvious and one not so obvious. The obvious one is George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, which includes several chapters set in Barcelona at the time when the uh, anarchist revolution was the most prevalent and visible uh, event going on in Barcelona. And the second one is an underrated but fabulous uh, book recently republished by J John Langdon Davis, called Behind the Spanish Barricades, which was written in the very first months of the Civil War and includes some stunning descriptions of uh, life in Barcelona at the time. Unlike Orwell, John Langdon Davis had the advantage of speaking both Spanish and Catalan. Uh, so he, he actually gives you a much deeper view, uh, even though he spent much less time here than George Orwell does in Homage to Catalonia. What was that life like then? What, what did he capture so well? Uh, the huge range of different opinions about what was going on, because he talked to people who were anarchists, who were communists, who were Catalanists or Catalan independentists even, and they all had different angles on uh, which way the war was going. They all agreed, obviously, that Franco had to be defeated. But then, you know, some wanted a revolution, some wanted an independent Catalonia, mm. some wanted both. Um, so he describes all that variety of thought and also the immediacy of living in a city which is being mobilized for war. Uh, there's some fabulous descriptions of, of that. How would uh, someone today coming to Barcelona best experience that book? You know, are there places to go to that connect with... Uh, very much. One that shouldn't be missed, in part because it's also very beautiful, is a square in the old town called San Felipe Neri. That's S-A-N-T-F-E-L-I-P-N-E-R-I. -E -E Two sides of the square are pockmarked with... Um, uh, bombs that fell from the, uh, I believe, the 1938 bombings of Barcelona, which was the first massive civilian bombing of a city in the 20th century, according to Winston Churchill, in Europe. And uh, so that's, and it's one of the quietest squares in Barcelona with a little fountain in the middle. So you, you sit in this very peaceful square watching all these bombed out walls. Um, what else? There's the Rambler itself, which has now become completely touristified. Yeah. But you can still and walk down it. And busy. Yeah. And, but you can still walk down it imagining the Rambler that George Orwell describes with everyone wearing their uh, blue overalls and carrying their their rifles and everything. You can just about still imagine it. Where else, if you wanted to be a little morbid, you could go up to Tibidabu, one of Barcelona's two mountains, and go to the Arrabasada, which is the road that drives down from the mountain into the city, which was where uh, not only the anarchists, but also some other revolutionary groups used to shoot their uh, uh, supposed traitors to the cause and they dump their bodies, uh, so you could go there, for example. That's all described in, in both books. That really is current, because there are investigations going on to, right now about what happened to a lot of these people. What happened? And John Langdon Davis goes into detail about it, because he visited the morgues, something that Orwell didn't do, 
and found that these reports of anarchists killing thousands of people were hugely exaggerated. Uh, for a city that was in a state of civil war, relatively few people were executed by anarchists and uh, other revolutionary forces. So it was, it was propaganda? It was propaganda. It was anti-republican propaganda. Two places more to visit. Do go to the uh, Monjuic Cemetery uh, and you can ask to see uh, particularly two graves. Uh, one is the gravesite of the three anarchists who, were, who died during the civil war, who were the most... Uh, popular and most charismatic anarchists of the time. Uh, that was uh, Francisco Ascaso and um, uh, Buenaventura Duruti. Their graves are uh, on Monjuic. And then there's the grave of the Catalan president during the Civil War, Luis Compines, who was arrested by the Nazis in Paris in 1940 and extradited on Franco's orders to Barcelona where he was shot on Monjuic Mountain, the only democratically elected president in the whole of the Second World War to be executed. So those graves are worth visiting as a, as a reminder, if you like, of, of what, was, uh, what was going on. Some of the propaganda that came out of the Civil War is, is revolutionary in, in mm. its use of certain techniques. Am I, some of the literature? Uh, or I'm thinking the... of actually some of the posters, for example, that we're oh, trying yeah. to attract the rest of the world to come to the aid of the Republicans. Well, Barcelona and Catalonia in general has a huge history of graphic art which starts at the end of the 19th century and moves on right through, well, right up to the end of the, the Civil War. One of the most famous posters is the one of the peasant with the raised scythe and behind yeah. him the word freedom, which was done by Carlos von Sarreb who died quite recently, about two years ago, in his mid-90s. And the originals of his work were ransacked by the, uh, uh, the, the nationalists, by the fascists, uh, by Franco's troops, when they came to Barcelona. They were transferred to an archive in Salamanca, which the Catalans have been trying to get back, the Catalan papers from Salamanca, uh, for years and years and years. And they finally managed to do it with the, lots of resistance from the people in Salamanca, lots of resistance from the Spanish government. But they did it only a year after Fonsoré died, so he never managed to get his original posters back. It's another example of a way in which the Civil War still has carried on in certain areas, you know, especially with the more right-wing Spanish governments. Was it a new graphic approach? Uh, simply, know? they just developed a, a very modern style in the in the European line of that of that time. Right. Uh, before the Civil War, there were two major cultural movements in Catalonia. One was modernism, which in architecture gave us Gaudí and other uh, architects in a similar, slightly similar style. And after and in literature, it had a movement, and in graphic design, it had a movement all of its own sort of the equivalent of Art Deco, if you like, in, in, in Catalonia. And after that came what in Catalan is called Nausentisme, which was an attempt to modernize cultural uh, Catalan culture along European lines, meaning basically French lines, sort of neoclassical and uh, more uh, reserved and uh, so forth. So these two movements had already had a lot of influence on graphics, Mm. Uh, by the time the Civil War rolled around, and you can see their influences in the Civil War posters. Libraries, the best one to go to is the, the Biblioteca de la Generalitat, the library of the Catalan Autonomous Government, which has almost all of this material, uh, and it can be visited, and you, you, know, you have to make an application, but it can be visited like any other library, it's open. So that's different from the Biblioteca Nacional de, de Catalunya? Yeah, the um, the the that's a, that's a beautiful lot. That's worth visiting too. It's got a lovely courtyard. And that's right. But it's, it's, but it's um, different. Th there are two. The the Biblioteca Nacional uh, is. I'm getting confused here myself. The Biblioteca Nacional de Catalunya. I'm sorry. Now I'm really getting confused. The Biblioteca Nacional de Catalunya is the one I meant. The Catalan oh, okay. National Library. Okay. Then there's another one, uh, which has fabulous documents in it. It's slightly outside Barcelona in a town called San Cugat, and it's called the Archivo de la Corona d'Aragon, the Archive of the Aragon, Aragonese Crown, because okay. the Aragonese Crown was controlled from Barcelona. It was the, the, the Catalans wouldn't allow their counts to become kings, so the 
Barcelona and counts took their royal titles from Aragon, which they also was formed part of their territories. And this archive is in San Cugat, and there you've got not just Civil War material, but you've got a huge range of graphic documents and manuscripts uh, mm. from the medieval right through to the uh, contemporary period. And so how far out of town is that? About 20 minutes okay. on, the, on the train. And Great. as we're on the Civil War, um, I would recommend, uh, without any doubt, uh, a novel called, uh, in English it's called In Diamond Square, by Merce Rodoreda, that's M-E-R-C-E, R-O-D-O-R-E-D-A. Uh, it's a fabulous book. It's internationally, it's, it's uh, uh, considered like a world-class novel. In uh, countries like Germany and Holland, for example, she's a household name, the author, not in England, not yet, I and mean, not in the English-speaking world. And it's, a, it's the civil war seen from the point of view of a working-class housewife who has nothing to do with it. Uh, so she's sitting there in her tiny little flat in the Gracia neighborhood and everyone who comes to Barcelona should go to the Gracia neighborhood and should go to Diamond Square, La Plaza del Diamant, which is still there, very much so, with a huge monument to Messe Rodoreda's book in the middle of it. And, uh, what, what does the monument look like? The monument is a, like a square of iron and the character, the main character in the book, is, is like squeezing her way through the iron, uh, which is more or less a good summary of what the book is about. And so it's a wonderful novel. Um, I don't think anyone would want their money back after, after buying it in Diamond Square by Messe Rodoreda. And if you read that and then go up to the Gracia district, which is very different from the rest of Barcelona, smaller streets, uh, more bohemian atmosphere and so forth, I think that would be a very nice experience for anyone. Mm -hmm. So moving uh, from the Spanish Civil War, mm. uh, any other time period that, that's re sort of represented physically uh, as well as in literature that, uh, that you can think of? Well, there's the, there's the famous book, uh, this one in Spanish, but there's also an English translation by Eduardo Mendoza which looks at Barcelona in the end, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries when the big trade fairs were on. Barcelona, City of Wonders. The City of Wonders is the English translation. And uh, that's an interesting look at that time period. It's not, it's not wartime, it's peacetime, but it gives an interesting view also of the contrast between the, uh, the middle classes and working classes in the, in the Catalonia of that period. Um, you mentioned trade fairs. What, what, what exactly? Is these are expos. What they now call expos. The great, these international the fairs, expos? world fairs. These yes. big world fairs. They had two: one in 1888 and the other one in 1920. I can't remember what. Yeah. Um, and they, in fact, left quite a mark on the city too. They left they? a huge mark yeah. on the city. A lot of people here made a lot of money out of them. There was a right. lot of speculation going on and stuff. But like the, when the Olympics came in '92. But they're an interesting period as well because they put Barcelona on the international map and a lot of extra building was done due to these uh, two trade world fairs. Yeah. Which, which, do you have a favorite uh, used antiquarian bookstore you like to go to or uh, a, a store that, uh, that you might recommend people uh, visit when they're here? Sure. I, myself, I tend not to buy second-hand books so much because here, unlike in some other countries, they tend to be quite expensive. Um, and I would recommend two. There is one in a street called Canuda, C-A-N-U-D-A, -A yeah. Carre Canuda, which is just off the Ramblers. You're walking down to the sea, it's just off to the left. If you walk along that, you can't miss it. There's a huge uh, bookstore which is open almost to the street, uh, which has some interesting stuff. Which is going out of business. Which is going to go out of business fairly soon. The last time I walked past, which was not so long ago, it was still open. So maybe if you're lucky... Well, I was just there, there, and there are big 50% off signs. So. Oh, okay. But I've talked to a number of people, and uh, no, no one's quite sure what's going to happen. If they're going to go online, or if they're going to open up a shop that's not as central, and the, where the rent's a bit less expensive. Yeah. But yeah, that's a beautiful bookstore, isn't it? Uh, and the other one is the um, Sunday mornings around the Sant Antoni Marques area. There's, there's what used to be only a huge second-hand book mart, but is now about 50% selling uh, DVDs, comics, 
people exchanging um, chromos, which are like bubblegum cards, something like that. So it's become like a kind of gaming area, people for game area for gamers. Yeah. But also, you can still occasionally find uh, some interesting stuff. I've I've found uh, most of it in Spanish and Catalan, but I've found books that I've been looking for for ten years. I've suddenly spotted them there and got hold. Of them. What about authors' houses or uh, writing writers? centers where they hold the author readings, that kind of thing? Sure. The easiest reference is the, the MACPA, that's the uh, Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, it has a square all of its own called the Plaza dels Angels, Square of the Angels, and there there is a, what looks like it's just a restaurant terrace, which is called the original, the original would be in English, l'original, spelt with an H, H and then the word original after it. Now, if you go there on a Wednesday evening, entrance is free, and every Wednesday evening it's poetry night, and it's got some of the, it depends on the night, but there are some very, very good live readings going on, usually a mixture of different poets in different languages, uh, not just Catalan and Spanish, but there's also been readings in English and in Urdu, uh, there's a big Pakistani community in one area of Barcelona. Well, well worth it. And uh, the, the restaurant isn't bad either, you know, and you can have a drink while you're listening to the poetry. And uh, Of all the literary spots or cafes in Barcelona, and there are, there are about 20, 25, uh, it's the most accessible and probably the most interesting and the most comfortable. Now, what about the book that you wrote about Barcelona? Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I wrote, uh, it came out in both Catalan and English. I, uh, basically in English I've been writing for about 10 years for various publications and uh, once for the London School of Economics about the situation in Catalonia, which includes everything, you know, it includes literature and it includes the political situation and my personal perception of life here and anecdotes and so forth. And all these, most of these texts were put through a selection process and published in English as Barcelona Catalonia Review from the Inside. It's not a tourist book by any definition, but it does cover, for your purposes, it does cover literary, uh, some literary uh, events and uh, talks about different writers and so forth. It, it sound, but it sounds like a pretty good primer for, you know, a whole variety of different aspects of life in the city. I would recommend it wholeheartedly. <laughs> it's uh, it's only ten euros. <laughs> That's it's available from all good online bookstores as and, a paperback and an ebook. And who publishes it? That's published by Cookwood Press, which is a small press in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, who also have an imprint because the owner of Cookwood is married to a Catalan, and Liz Castro is her name, and she's. Um, uh, uh, very interested in Catalonia and the situation of Catalonia, so she now has an imprint of Cookwood, which is just called Catalonia Press, which are for books about the area. Just uh, finally, and we're looking at a married couple here, I think, going yes, by. Yes, we in are. Wow. In a horse and wagon, which is not normal at all, normal, in fact. And they're holding up all the traffic. Yeah, right. yeah, with a lot of motorcycles behind them. Yeah, I have not seen that before. <laughs> Your novel, Snug. I wonder how Barcelona uh, living here in, informed the development of that novel. The, the novel is about a, a tiny, self-complacent English village on the south side of the Isle of Wight which suddenly finds itself surrounded by Africans, besieged by Africans who have gone there for that very purpose. So, that, not Africans from Europe, I mean Africans, Africans, who've gone from Africa to that village. To, to take it over? To take it over. Okay. And, uh, uh, in sort the, of like in the book, Spain taking over Catalan? Well, put it like this, it's nothing about Catalonia, it's nothing to do with Catalonia, but certainly the experience here uh, has helped a little. Uh, in, the, in the sense of, well, mainly of just getting a different take on your own country as well, because you look at things from a Catalan point of view, a Catalan perspective, which is the perspective of a, a small country, a small culture, a, a small language, nine and a half million people speak Catalan, and it gives you a completely different view from the English, specifically English point of view, 
which always strikes me as being a little pompous without unknowingly pompous because there is a tendency in England to think that English is the only real language. You know, yeah. if, if it's not in English, it doesn't really exist, this kind of mentality. Sort of ethnocentric. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, in literary magazines, for example, you often see so-and-so has written probably the best novel in the 20th century. But in fact, what's missing is the word the best English language yes. novel, you yes. know, the, the, et cetera. Yeah. So in a way... Well, when you sorry, when you mm. think of it, though, when, when you think of the ten, quote, greatest novels ever written, seven or eight of them are originally in, written in ang languages that were not English. Yeah. So, 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 so what, being under siege, sort of? Uh, uh, no, more the, the distance. Uh, the distance. I, a friend of mine here, a Catalan writer, he, he, his novels are set in, and stories are set in Catalonia, mainly in Barcelona, but he always feels to write them, he has to go abroad, you know, so yeah. he spends long periods abroad writing these novels. Yeah. And for me, as I live abroad, in inverted commas, that actually helped me a great deal, not only to write about England and my memories of it and how I uh, perceived it and still perceive it in many ways, mm. but also things to do with the language, because I don't pick up temporary slang. Yeah, or cliches. Uh, cliches. I notice them all the time in, in English media, but I don't pick them up. I'm not surrounded by them. So I've kind of found my own way of writing English, my own voice in written English, mm. which is I never found before when I was living there, which is one of the reasons why I switched to writing in Catalan, where I found my written voice earlier. And so it was Catalan that actually helped me find my written voice in English. It was that discipline of writing for 10 years mm. only in Catalan, a foreign language. And after that discipline, I found I, I had got my written voice in English. I'd gotten over my obstacles with British English, I should say, mm. you know, which is different from Canadian or American, Australian English. So that was one influence. The other big influence has just been Catalan literature. Um, the Catalan-speaking areas have a literature which is completely disproportionate to the amount of people who actually speak the language. I mean, mm. it has a vast literature with some tremendous pieces of writing in it. Mm. And I've, I've been soaking this up for about 30 years, uh, ever since I learned the language. And I've got, had a lot of good lessons from those writers which um, any of them uh, translated into English? Definitely. Yeah. No, there's one who is now slowly beginning to be completely translated into English, which is a, a contemporary writer. He's now 60 years old, who I learned a great deal from. He's called Kim Monzo. Uh, in English, there's a problem with Kim because it's spelled Q U I M, but it's uh. Monzo, M O N Z O. And uh, he normally writes short stories, the occasional novel. Uh, the novel has been translated as the magnitude, what's it called in English, The Magnitude of the Tragedy, something like that. Collections of his short stories have also been published. He's available. If you look, at, if you look up his surname, you'll find him online with no problem. And you learn a lot about uh, writing from him because he's a sort of, he's a no-bullshit writer, you know. He, he hates excessive mm. adjectivization, excessive verbalization, and he knows exactly what he's doing and what he wants to say. And uh, there's very little of his stuff that I, I, I couldn't recommend, in fact. Oh, okay. Joyce left Dublin to write about Dublin for the rest of his life. Mm. And Ibsen wrote uh, Peer Gint when he was in Ischia. In okay. the sunshine. That I didn't know. Yeah. So, and he felt freed from all of the mores of uh, the stifling Norwegian culture, social life <laughs> in Nor yeah. in Norway. Yeah. I, I, maybe it's the sunshine, or is it? What What is it that that has released you to write about your own country in, in the last? Well, in of years? in many ways, like living in Catalonia is like living in a hermetically sealed bubble, because. Almost nobody abroad knows anything about what's going on here, what the literature is, the yeah. language. Yeah. They know, you know, zilch. Mm -hmm. So, zero. So, it, you're not only living abroad, you're living in a bubble abroad. And that, in fact, gives you, if you're writing, it gives you a fantastic sense of isolation. But at the same time, although people are not in touch with you, you're in touch with everything else, just like anybody else is. So uh, I, I like that sense of feeling kind of in my bubble in Catalonia because it gives me uh, a double distance, in fact, from, from where I was born and where I was brought up and where I lived till I was 26 years old. So, and that helps a great deal when writing about it to, be, to write about it in a way that's both creative and objective at the same time, something like that.
Well, thanks for sharing some of the contents of the bubble with us uh, this <laughs> afternoon. You're very welcome. I've been speaking with uh, Matthew Tree, who has written a book of essays and articles entitled Barcelona, Catalonia, A View from the Inside by Cockwood Press, and most recently Snug, published through an agent here in Barcelona, is that correct? That's right. It's uh, Funnily enough, she's an American, but um, she was uh, born in Majorca and works out of Barcelona, Antonia Carrigan. Uh, she liked the book enough to send it with very eager covering letters, very enthusiastic covering letters, to a wide range of UK publishers. Uh, she had a, a couple of pleasant, very pleasant rejections. I mean, kind of rejections I almost felt like getting a bottle of carver out of the fridge for. They were so nice. But the rest of these publishers simply didn't reply to her, which irritated her because she, she has done a lot of business in the UK, but she doesn't usually offer English originals. She offers Spanish or Catalan originals. And she felt they weren't kind of trusting her on this. So she, does, she has a little publishing wing. So she put Snug out on this public to get it out, to get it available on the internet. It's available as an ebook paperback. The edition is professional, it's been professionally corrected. But we're still fishing, meanwhile, for a bigger publisher so it can get to more readers. That's the idea. But so the the publisher is called AK Digital, which is Antonia Kerrigan Digital. It's her publishing arm. And uh, that's the situation with the novel at the moment. It's very recent. It came out in March of this year. And you can, you can get it on Amazon is the easiest? Or? Amazon's the easiest. All the Amazons. It's on every Amazon site okay. in the world. Um, but uh, shortly it's going to be available on other, um, other websites as well. Great. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your time. Hey, thank Great you. Great to talk to you.